Good afternoon. What a great day it is today. And it's great to have all of you here today. We have three guests at this SGL that because they are friends, I took the privilege of having the opportunity and the privilege to introduce them and to talk about them a little bit so that you know who they are as you listen to them today in this SGL. So to my immediate left is Captain Tom Kelly. He is our Medal of Honor recipient and an alum. He, he went to Boston College High School and to Holy Cross. He got his Master of Arts in Management at NPS. And he, and he has an honorary doctorate of humane letters from the, the Massachusetts School of Psychology and on, on, and on behalf of returning Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom Veterans. So that's what he has done has, as of, as of uh, recently. Let's talk about, though, what he did a while back. So, June 15, 1969, when Captain Kelly, I mean, when Lieutenant Kelly was serving with the Navy's River Assault Division 152, led a column of eight assault craft up the Ong Mung Canal in Kien Hua province of Vietnam. His mission to extract a company of U.S. Army infantry troops. When one of the boats experienced a mechanical failure of its loading ramp, enemy forces opened fire on the opposite bank approximately 50 meters away. Ordering the disabled unit to raise its loading ramp manually, Kelly then commanded the remaining boats to circle and protect it before maneuvering his own craft into the direct line of fire of enemy fire. Shortly thereafter, an enemy rocket struck close to where Kelly commanded the defense and the resulting explosion knocked him down, causing serious head wounds. Disregarding his injuries, and let me describe for a minute, he had the explosion hit by his head and knocked out his eye and opened up his skull. From that point of his injuries, Kelly continued directing the boats under his command, relaying orders through one of his men until the enemy attack ceased and his column could vacate the area his Medal of Honor citation goes on to read, Lieutenant Commander Kelly's brilliant leadership, bold initiative, and resolute determination served to inspire his men and provide the impetus needed to carry out the mission. His, his extraordinary courage under fire and his selfless devotion to duty sustain and enhance the finest traditions of the U.S. Naval Service. But what does Captain Kelly say at that time, Lieutenant Commander Kelly, about the incident? And this is kind of his ethos. I know that my life was saved by second class corpsman Richard Nelson, who under fire brought his medical aid boat alongside and jumped aboard my craft and saved me. This is the kind of uh, person that we have as one of our alums. But I must say is that what Captain Kelly did after all that, after he, what, as a, as a lieutenant commander, he has, his, he has a glass eye, one eye, has a plate in his head, and he goes to the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Zumwalt, and says, I want to continue to serve. Not very often did anybody in that condition ever get that kind of permission. I'm not quite sure, I've not done all my history that anybody had. Admiral Zumwalt agreed. So he continued his service, and then, <laughs> then goes on to command a frigate. And he goes on then to do other work within Washington, D.C., helping sailors and working the personnel issues of, of, of our Navy. And after that, after his, his retirement, continued to work with the veterans or uh, uh, the Veterans Administration of, Mass of Massachusetts, as well as with the federal uh, government, and has been dedicated to, to that kind of work, charity work, for his entire adult life. And that is. Captain Tom Kelly. Admiral Robert Natter. 
So Admiral Natter, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Captain Kelly has a wonderful wife named Joan. Joan, I wanted to be sure that I mentioned each of the wives here. It's here somewhere. Joan was in the Navy also from 1979 to 1999 as a public affairs officer. She went to Boston University and got her master's in public and in PR, public re relations, and her JD out of the New England Law School. She was a uh, civilian general counsel with various of the, of the Massachusetts agencies as well as veterans organizations. And she proudly says that she's the, the mother of Brian O'Connor. And what Joan has been is such a compliment to her husband Tom in her work for veterans and for the Navy. And when, and when you see those two, these two people around, sailors, they are in heaven. And so I want to thank Joan and to acknowledge her as well. Emma Bob. Admiral Bob Natter. He grew up in a, in a family with a profound commitment to military service. All six of the brothers served in uniform. I worked for one of them, Jack, while his two sisters married servicemen. Admiral Natter enlisted in, in the Navy at the age of 17 and attended boot camp before following two older brothers to the, to the, Naval, to the Naval Academy. He saw continuous service and duty in operations in the rivers and coastal waters off Vietnam. After three years and long overdue for shore duty, Admiral Natter became officer in charge of a SEAL boat support detachment in the lower Mekong Delta. Three months in, a small craft was caught in a Viet Cong fight and all aboard were killed or wounded. Seriously injured, with massive burns on his body, Admiral Natter swam ashore and then back with one other crewman, directing suppressing fire to bring the damaged boat through a, hot, through a hail of enemy fire. And for that action, he was awarded the, the Silver Star and, and Purple Heart medals. He earned his master's here at NPS. And then he, he completed destroyer school and became an operations officer on USS Bradley. He served all kinds of, of, of tours, in, in including the XOs of ships, the executive uh, assistant to the, to the director of naval warfare and the commanding officer of Chandler. He, he graduated with distinction from the Naval War, War College and of course earned his master's at Regina uh, College and then of course here. Admiral Natter served a number of tours in Washington holding jobs such as the House Armed Services Committee, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Bureau of Naval Personnel. He was the Chief of Legislative Affairs, Naval Space, uh, Naval Space Command, Control, and, and Communications Systems, and as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Plans, Policy, and Operations. Operational tours. He was the CEO of Antietam, commander of 7th Fleet, commander of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet, commander of U.S. Fleet Forces, and it goes on. What's interesting about Admiral Natter is his work afterwards. He is also very dedicated in public service, so having his own, con con uh, his own con consulting firm is one thing but he has been chairman of the Naval Academy Alumni uh, Association. He has been a board member of the National Navy UDT and SEAL, Mu and SEAL Museum, and he's also on the NPS Foundation Council of Advisors. He was instrumental in the building of the, of the um, Cyber Center, the Hopper Center at the Naval Academy, and he's been instrumental in doing things here to make sure that we have a Naval Innovation Center over time. His wife, Claudia. Claudia. Her father was one of the original UDT officers in World War II, known as MacArthur's Frogman. As the, at the Command Naval Special Warfare Command, the building, the headquarters building is named after him, the Captain Frank Kane Building. 
Also, to Claudia's credit, all three of their daughters became naval officers. Kelly from Notre Dame earned the Naval Helo Pilot of the Year Award. Kendall Villanova, Roxy as a Navy nurse, and Courtney as a U.S. Naval Academy Surface Warfare Officer. Sons-in-law, two active duty Navy SEALs, and a very supportive third husband. God bless him. <laughs> and, his, and the Admiral's quote about Claudia. Claudia deserves a credit for the example of a spouse who let the kids be kids and enjoy the benefits of a Navy life. Admiral Natter. Now, I couldn't let these two great leaders be interviewed by anybody. So I asked Admiral Olson. Admiral Eric Olson has been with NNPS faithfully in service to us for a long time. And when he was uh, the um, commander of Naval, of Naval Special Warfare, and I'll get to his background in a minute though, he was the one who brought more SEALs than anybody in any other time and has continued the commitment of Navy SEALs and Special Forces coming to NPS. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but he was senior, of course, to Admiral Bill McRaven when it came to things. So he, he came here first, and then Admiral McRaven, as lieutenant, comes here and does a lot of the work that then developed DA, the Department of DA. But Admiral Olson uh, is, a is, um, uh, is the former United States Special Operations Commander. He was the first Navy SEAL ever, first Navy SEAL ever to be appointed to three and four star flag rank, as well as the first Naval officer to be the U.S. SOCOM um, commander, and he was relieved again by, Mo, by Bill McRaven. So it's wonderful to have Admiral Olson here, and I'm not going to go on to everything else about him except one thing. October 3rd, 1993, about a third of the, of the task force launched, to, launched a daylight raid uh, at Mogadishu, where two of, of, of the aides were, were meeting. And this is about the Battle of, of Mogadishu. And what happens here is, that, of course, he is, a, he is an observer. And he is not there as a warfighter, per se. But what happened then is that um, they had the helicopters shot down and nearly 100 troops trapped in the center of the city by heavy enemy fire. As night fell, Olson and Lee Van Arsdale, as, as, as this go, a Delta Force officer, were ordered to help put together a, a relief team that would have to, have to twice pass through the same shooting gallery that had killed more than a dozen of their comrades and wounded many others. Together, they guided a column of 200 U.S. troops and armored personnel vehicles driven by other troops through the narrow streets that the down helicopters were in where the original assault force had, had set up a um, perimeter. And, and it goes on. What's interesting about this is that he was there as an observer and, and immediately had, had to respond as a warrior. So they call him the quiet warrior because you won't hear about that from Admiral Olson. You'll hear about the future of the force and a very, um, a very important point of, of view that it's, it's always interesting to think about running into the enemy fire. It's more important to deter the enemy fire from ever happening. Let's talk about Maryland. Maryland, um, Maryland and the Admiral uh, got married and then came to DLI and, 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 and NPS. So now he, has, he is the best husband to marry because now he brings his wife to Monterey for four years. Well done. So, but they met in Jerusalem because he was um, working as a UN uh, observer and she was working in support of, and, and she was on the UN staff. So these are all leaders and their spouses. And I want to really bring that home. Leaders and spouses who have led this country and have led the globe, and not only what it means to be, to have the heart of a warrior, but the heart of a leader of, of humility, of, of sacrifice, of service above self, and of a husband, and of fathers, and brothers. These are three 
fantastic leaders, and it would be my pleasure and honor to have you now get to know them. Admiral Olson, sir, over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Admiral President, and uh, greetings to everybody. Thank you for being here. It's certainly a privilege for me to be back at NPS and with all of you here today, and it's, uh, it's my highest honor uh, to share the stage with these two icons of the surface warfare community who, by the way, have both been adopted uh, enthusiastically by the Naval Special Warfare community. Admiral Natter, as Admiral Rondo said, did lead a SEAL detachment and saved a lot of SEALs' lives. Uh, in Vietnam and has been a close member of the community, uh, a close associate of the, of the Naval Special Warfare community, including serving, serving on our museum's board uh, for a long, long time. And of course, Captain Kelly, as a Medal of Honor recipient, uh, was adopted by the Naval Special Warfare community. His picture and a plaque uh, about uh, Captain Kelly are on the wall of the Frank Kane building which is the headquarters of Naval Special Warfare, named after Claudia Natter's dad, uh, currently commanded by Rear Admiral Keith Davids, who is here today uh, with the Naval Special Warfare Command Force Master Chief uh, Walter Dittmar. Uh, so a great honor to be with you two gentlemen here today. And, and I, I don't want to really add on to Admiral Rondeau's introductions, except to mention that I'm sure you all know that both Captain Kelly and Admiral Natter are being inducted into the Naval Postgraduate School Hall of Fame tomorrow afternoon, and so I hope many of you can be there. I'll also mention that uh, because it's sort of breaking news, or at least fairly recent news, the Secretary of the Navy announced that an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, the 90th ship of that fantastic class of ships, is going to be named the USS Thomas G. Kelly when it's commissioned at some future date. So you've heard their bios, but I would also urge you to look them up on Wikipedia or whatever your sources of information are, because it's much richer. Their, their lives are, are much richer than Admiral Rondeau could go over in a few minutes uh, on this stage. If you are, you know, they are heroes, they are icons, they are, mm -hmm. if, if you are looking for role models in your professional careers, you don't have to look farther than the two men in front of you on this stage. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I'm going to go to the audience for any questions. And I also am prepared with some questions that were anonymous, anonymously submitted by members of the audience. So I'll work those into my questions. We're going to wrap up by 16.30, as promised. Uh, but we'll spend uh, as much time as we possibly can listening about the, you know, the experiences, the wisdom, the lives of these of these two gentlemen. And we'll start with, with valor in combat. Um, you have the Medal of Honor, Captain Kelly. You have a silver star. You have a bronze star with Admiral Natter. With, you have a bronze star with a V for valor. You have a Navy Commendation Medal with a V for valor. You even have a Navy Achievement Medal with a V uh, for valor. And both of you chose to be in riverine warfare, which was known to be dangerous at the time you volunteered to do it. Both of you did multiple missions. Both of you were seriously injured in combat. Both of you, after sustaining your injuries, went back into the fight to position yourselves in ways uh, to protect and save the men uh, who were with you on that mission. So the, the, the question is, can you share with us, as, as combat veterans at the highest level, sort of what you saw around you on those days. What were you thinking before, during, and immediately after the combat action? What's the mindset of a warrior knowing that you're being shot at uh, and making decisions under fire? Mm -hmm. Captain Kelly, can we go to you first? Yes, sir. Um, well, I was a new kid on the block. I had been in country for <clears throat> about eight months, eight or nine months. But my unit was turned over to the uh, Vietnamese Navy in uh, April, I think, of 1969. And um, 
I was transferred over to a new unit, uh, River Salt Division 152, and I, I really didn't know anybody. They had been in country for, you know, a year and a half or so, and uh, their commander had left, and they, they plugged me in there. I, I didn't know anybody, but uh, this unit was about uh, 200 sailors, uh, two officers, including me, and I was totally at their mercy uh, going out on ops because I'd done ops in my previous uh, unit, but there's a whole, whole new crew, and I had the utmost faith and confidence in them. I had to, <clears throat> uh, and they saved my life on the day I got hit on June 15, 1969. Uh, Admiral Rondeau mentioned uh, <clears throat> HM2 Richard uh, Nelson, who brought his aid boat alongside me. But when I got hit, uh, I was a zombie. Uh, you know, I was hurt pretty bad, and uh, my men, kept on going, you know, and, and the, my citation says I continued to direct the fight through a radio re relay to my man. The truth is, they did it, and they got us out of there. Uh, they, they saved my life, the corpsman did, and we got out of there without another injury. So I had utmost faith uh, in the men I was with. Uh, they took care of me, we completed the mission, and uh, it inspired my, love long, my, my lifelong love for uh, what enlisted men and women can do uh, and on their own. Thank you. Admiral Naber? Well, uh, you know, certainly something like this is uh, a shock to the system when you get shot and uh, everybody on the boat, it was, as was mentioned, was wounded or killed. Jim Thames, a Navy SEAL, was killed right next to me. Uh, getting blown into the water, coming up, I had one thought. I'm responsible for this. What am I going to do? And it came down to you, you give, excuse me. I don't, I don't usually talk about this, but one thing, I've got a duty. All these men at the time took a sworn oath to obey the officers over them. My job was to make sure that we got out of there and that we were able to respond as professionally as possible. I wanted to make damn sure I didn't fail in that responsibility. The rest wasn't important. Two other people were killed in the water swimming. And you don't think about that. You think about doing your duty. And any officer here who doesn't think about that is not doing his or her duty in the first place. So that's all I could think about, and that's all I dwelt on the whole day that this occurred. So sorry about this. Uh, that. Thank you, and I'll just uh, sort of editorialize the, the, about, about the about the camaraderie of, of of warfare. If you go back and look at the citations for the highest awards that have been awarded going back 40, 50 years or more, most of the highest awards are actually awarded for saving lives, not for taking lives. It is the act of choosing to put yourself mm -hmm in the most hazardous situations in order to save the lives of the people around you. So mm -hmm. people are alive now because of what you two did and thank you very much for that. Um, you both came into the Navy by choice bef before the draft ended in 1973 and we transitioned to what we now call the all-volunteer Navy. Can you describe how the Navy changed as the as the draft e age ended and the all recruited Navy uh, became 100% of, of the naval force. But, mm -hmm. but really the question is about, do you think we can go back to sort of conscripted service, either military or other public service? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as Admiral Wilson said, uh, the draft ended in 1973. Uh, I was actually here. <laughs> at the PG school at that time, and then went to my XO tour and then my CO tour. Uh, first of all, there were no women on, on uh, any of my ships. I retired in 1990 before women were allowed to uh, serve on warships. Um, but uh, around 1973, it was just post-Vietnam, Navy had lots of problems, a lot of drug problems, a lot of racially uh, instigated problems. Uh, when the all-volunteer force came along in 1973, uh, I noticed a, a definite uh, improvement in relations because we were able to screen people coming in. 
Uh, people knew they were subject to uh, tests and this, that, and the other thing. And I, I noticed a, a, a real improvement in the quality of the sailors that, uh, that uh, I was privileged to lead. Uh, as far as conscription, conscription uh, I, I don't think it's going to go anywhere in this country, but I do believe strongly in public service. And I think every, every child, every boy and girl coming out of high school uh, should serve their fellow Americans uh, in some way for a year or two. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, we are a better military today because it's volunteer. The, with that volunteering comes responsibility. In the days, especially the Vietnam days, toward the end of the draft, we had a lot of folks who were there because they had to go there. Uh, and some of them were not good for the service and for the cohesion of the units. Uh, and afterwards, I think it actually improved that cohesion and the professionalism of our units. Having said that, we've got challenges today with numbers. You know the stories about some of our youth need to be in better shape, drugs, you name it. But I do think this is a successful formula for manning and operating our military forces. With respect to the future of the draft, I agree with Tom 100% that some sort of volunteer work for the government, somebody other than yourself, is important to the cohesion of the country. Uh, I think we could benefit for that, from that, but I think it's really going to be expensive if we ever try to do it. Uh, if we ever had a draft, I think it could be uh, successful only with one instance, and that's leadership of the country. Without that, it won't work. And it's that leadership would have to be because of the threat of the nation's survival, uh, which we haven't witnessed since World War II, really. Uh, hopefully, we won't ever have to witness that. But that's the only occasion where I think the draft would work. Uh, and it would require the leadership of a Roosevelt, of a, a president that we haven't seen lately. So that's my view on the draft and uh, volunteer force. Yeah, thank you. We'll go back to the Brownwater Navy for a minute. I'm drawing on a couple of questions submitted by some of you, a couple of you out in the audience uh, today. The, the question is about opportunities for early command, meaning at the, at the lieutenant level, maybe the very junior uh, lieutenant commander level, your opportunities in the Brownwater Navy to command early with huge responsibility and, and the limited opportunities to do that now, and the, and the question is about the value of putting junior officers in those types of leadership positions as growth opportunities early in their careers, and connected to that is a question about how hard it is to train uh, for the stress of combat situations in non-combat uh, environments and training scenarios. So how might junior officers prepare themselves uh, to lead in combat? Admiral Maver, if I can go to you first on this one. Well, I think there are responsibilities as a junior officer today that can prepare you for that. For example, an engineer on a ship uh, as an officer uh, responsible for the safety and the operational effectiveness of your division or your department. And there's pressure there and there's times when you're going to have to make some tough on the scene decisions that could affect the lives of your fellow shipmates and the ship itself, the safety of that ship. And so we all get thrown into that. We as a service have the greatest opportunity in our society to really have responsibilities as a junior officer that no civilian can ever appreciate. They really don't understand that at all. And they certainly don't have the opportunity that all of you all have as a junior officer to lead men and women and to have them be effective and also enjoy their hard work. Because if you do it right, they do enjoy. They enjoy the success, they enjoy the hard work, but most of all, they want to be very successful both personally and as a unit. And so if you can imbue that kind of uh, responsibility and level of uh, re um, success with your unit, then you, you can command just about anything. So I don't think you have to actually be in combat to be able to be a leader in combat. You've got to be able to accept responsibility and you've got to be able to understand that you can make things happen 
if your people respect you and if you do the things that are expected of them. Yeah, thank you. Captain Kelly? I had a squadron commander in my early days in the Navy uh, <clears throat> whose mantra was uh, train, maintain, retain. And those are three very important words and for a junior officer or a senior petty officer. Uh, you owe it to your people that you're responsible for to train them up, give them the best equipment possible under the circumstances and hope that uh, your example and your compassion for them, that they will recognize that and remain in the Navy because the Navy needs people like that. Thank you. Um, Captain Kelly, you, you, uh, I'll give the audience a heads up. You wanted me to ask you this next question. So I'm, <laughs> I, 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 I'm uh, and, and it's an important one. Uh, you were there in the early days of diversity, equality, and inclusion, DEI, be before we called it that. Mm -hmm. um, Admiral Borda, uh, Chief of Naval Operations, who himself came out of the enlisted ranks, mm -hmm. uh, asked you to come to Washington and lead efforts to improve education for the enlisted force. Mm -hmm and enhance the stature of enlisted personnel across the Navy, and also integrate minorities and women into more robust roles in Navy leadership, into more important assignments. How do you think the Navy's doing with that? Well, I, I gotta go back to uh, <clears throat> 1990, uh, when I first met uh, Commander uh, Ann Rondeau, and um, she, is about to be, she was about to become the first uh, female battalion officer over at the Naval Academy. And Admiral Borda put together a task force uh, consisting of uh, Admiral uh, Doug Katz, a couple of captains, uh, Commander Rondeau and I. And uh, we went over to the Naval Academy because they had some issues. They were tying women to uh, uh, toilet bowls and things like that, really bad. And we went over there and spent a few days. And one of the uh, most significant recommendations uh, that came out of that was to uh, put a senior chief petty officer in each company uh, at the Naval Academy. They didn't have senior uh, enlisted uh, at that time, before that time, at the Naval Academy. And I think that speaks volumes about how important enlisted personnel, men and women, are for unit integrity, uh, success of an organization, and uh, mentoring offices like me and you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for getting all of that started. Uh, I'll, I'll go to another question that was submitted by the audience uh, in much more recent history. Um, in 2021, U.S. forces departed Afghanistan, a major theater of war for this generation of service members, and there's still mixed emotions about the way we left Afghanistan and what we left behind. Can, can you offer parallels um, between our departure from Afghanistan and our departure from Vietnam, uh, which, you've, which you were there for? And can you offer any lessons or encouragement as you led military formations post-Vietnam uh, towards other major challenges and, and other adversaries? Who wants to go first? I'm on out. Okay. Well, I'll let the record show I didn't want you to ask me any questions. <laughs> <laughs> So, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> compare, compare our departure from Afghanistan with our departure yeah. from Vietnam. Well, obviously, this country has a history since World War II of getting into wars and not knowing how to get the hell out of them. That's a political statement and not one that we should dwell on. I, there certainly, I think everyone here would agree that there are tactical uh, decisions that were made in both instances that were not productive or helpful. Uh, having said that, the political decision to get out is one that I don't argue with. It's a political decision. It's well above any person wearing the uniform's pay grade to dwell on. Our job is to provide the best, most candid, forceful advice to the Commander-in-Chief and the people under him and between him and yourself on what you think is the right approach. That's all we can do. As a military, I mean, we take a sworn oath that the civilian leadership is the leadership and that we don't try and displace them. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, you know, I, we, I'm not happy with the way we withdrew in any, 
either scenario, but I don't argue with the political realities of doing it. Uh, uh, and so that's all I'll say. I do have opinions there, but I don't think it's appropriate in a military setting to express those opinions. I wouldn't have done it that way, but I don't argue with the withdrawal itself. When we were preparing for this, I, I told Admiral Nader and Captain Kelly that it was my intent to follow the wardroom rules here and, and not discuss sex, religion, or politics, and they both enthusiastically embraced that. <laughs> uh, but, but what about shaking that off? in order to look forward and get ready for what's coming next. How do you think we, sh we sort of, as a military, shook off Vietnam because we had other things on our plate to get ready for? Well, we, we shook off Vietnam because we had no choice. Mm -hmm. uh, look, the military was not treated well. Those in uniform were not treated well uh, during, especially toward the end of the war and certainly thereafter. No one could argue with that fact, in my view. I think the public does a better job today because they know that this is not a military decision. The war was not executed well, but it wasn't because the military didn't want to execute it differently. Mm -hmm. So I, I just don't know that it matters, yeah. really. Uh, our job is to execute, give the best advice possible, and do it in a very honest way. Uh, and that's, that's really all we could ask for. That's my view. Oh, thank you. Captain Kelly, do you have? Well, just re remember the uh, oath we all took at one time. Um, support, defend the Constitution, uh, obey the or orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over me. I mean, uh, that that's, should be in the back of your mind or your front of your mind uh, every, every minute of every day. Um, and I. I I, I, I had a very sad experience a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was uh, watching a football game, and um, some enlistees, uh, they call them poolies in the Marine Corps, uh, were down on the field being sworn in by the commandant, or the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps. And uh, they repeated the oath, you know, repeat after me your name, blah, 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 blah. And I came to the, uh, and obey the off offices of the President of the United States, and a bunch of boos rang out through the grandstand. And, uh, you know, it's such a sacred oath we take. It broke my heart, to tell you the truth. Yeah, thank you. Um, Captain Kelly, I'm going to ask you uh, 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 to, to share sort of your personal experience with us as a Medal of Honor recipient. And I'll preface it by saying some of the Medal of Honor recipients that I know have, have of course talked about what a high honor it is to, to wear the medal, but it also is a huge commitment and occasionally a burden. They say, you know, an adage is that as difficult as it is, as much as you went through and sacrificed to perform the actions for which you were awarded the medal, it's sometimes harder to wear it for the rest of your life. Um, can, you, can you talk about two things? One, and, and if I could say that it's also a personal choice by you when and where to wear the medal in a, in a public setting. Uh, you're mm -hmm. wearing it now on your lapel in a small version, but you weren't wearing it yesterday. You didn't wear it last night. Mm -hmm. and, and I could tell stories about, you know, sort of personal stories about mm -hmm people I know who, who had to struggle with a decision about when and where mm -hmm. uh, to, to wear that um, medal. But you, you not only have worn it now for 60 years, uh, but you also were president of the Medal of Honor Society. You, you were the, the guide for those coming in as new recipients mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the medal. How did how did you deal with all of well, that? Well, first of all, to put it in perspective, uh, when I received the medal back in uh, 1970, I think there were about 350 or so living recipients. And of course, I was a, a young, uh, young lieutenant at the time, lieutenant commander. Uh, so now we're down to 65 living recipients. And I think about 18 of them, or 16 of them, are uh, war, war on terror. Uh, recipients. 
In other words, the old guys like me were kind of fading away. And as a matter of fact, we had our annual convention uh, last month down in uh, New Orleans, and our whole board, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, are all war on terror people. Uh, Britt Soblinski, president, uh, uh, Will, uh, what's Will's last name? Will, army guy, who's here at the school. <laughs> uh, Will Swenson. Um, uh, Kyle Carpenter, Marine, and uh, Mike Williams, army guy. Th th that's, our, that's our current board, which I think is a great thing. Uh, getting back to, uh, you know, wearing the medal. Uh, first of all, when you receive it, the old guys tell you, you know, don't mess it up, don't disgrace us. And uh, so you're in the public eye all the time. Uh, and that's a good thing to remember. It's essential to remember that. Um, the other thing is, once you receive the Medal of Honor, instantly uh, you become a hero, a hero to a whole bunch of people, the American people, fellow sailors and soldiers, Marines, etc. Um, and it's, it's, you have to do your best to come down off that lofty perch and, you know, let humility take over. You know, we wear this medal, I wear this medal for all the millions and millions of men and women who have served over the years who uh, didn't receive any kind of honor, many of whom did not come back. I work for them. So you have to keep that in perspective. As being president of the Medal of Honor Society, <laughs> Uh, it's like an unruly family of uh, 65 or, or more uh, unruly children sometimes. Uh, and keeping, you know, I, I, can't, we, uh, I can't keep them in line. They have First Amendment rights. Uh, they're grown, grown men, all men right now. There is one woman who received the Medal of Honor, um, many, many, Mary Walker, a Civil War a sur surgeon. But right now, uh, no women. Um, and um, where was I? Mm. Yeah, um, th they were all individuals, and, and um, I, during my tenure as Medal of Honor uh, President, Medal of Honor Society President, uh, I faced a couple of challenges. Number one, by our Congressional Charter, 1954, I think it was. Uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor Society is apolitical. They are not allowed to take a political stance on anything. Uh, and uh, I, t I, took that, I take that very seriously. Unfortunately, uh, we're made up of uh, American citizens who uh, have First Amendment rights. They can say whatever they want. And to see uh, 25 or so of my fellow recipients standing beside, let's say, a presidential candidate with the medals around their neck and say, we, we endorse this presidential candidate or this governor or whatever, uh, it kind of breaks my heart to tell you the truth because uh, the American people look on this and say, oh, you know, they're all a bunch of political hacks. So, so that's, that's tough to take. But uh, I, I believe that we should be to totally apolitical and I do my best to uh, get the word out to people. But they all say, hey, you come from the, uh, People's Republic of Massachusetts, what the hell do you know, you know? <laughs> That's not a political comment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, back to you, Captain Kelly, and maybe a follow-on for you, Admiral, now, depending on what Captain Kelly says. <laughs> I'll say nothing. <laughs> yeah, I know nothing. <laughs> Uh, like, the, like the Brownwater Navy, I would say the logistic support to the fleet has probably never garnered the level of respect mm -hmm. uh, that it deserves. But toward the ends of your career, you served in command of Military Sealift Command Far East, uh, based out of Yokohama, Japan, uh, with a task group designator under 7th Fleet, which was commanded later by mm -hmm. Admiral Natter. Uh, you have a story about working with Com 7th Fleet and the Secretary of the Navy during that period. Uh, can you share it with us? Well, uh, I was commander MSC Far East, and for those of you who don't know about MSC, it's the, uh, it's the, DO, uh, the, the sea ocean end of uh, providing logistics to the Department of Defense. Merchant ships, we charter merchant ships, bring cargo around the world, this, that, and the other thing. 
But in that particular position I was in, I, I, asked, I had a Seventh Fleet hat also, and I was responsible not for the operations of the replenishment fleet, but the care and maintenance and overhaul of uh, replenishment ships in the Seventh Fleet. And um, when, when it was time for them to uh, go into overhaul or maintenance, uh, they chop to, uh, to us and we'd arrange a shipyard in Japan or someplace, put them in and uh, sign a contract, oversee the work and send them back to Commander Seventh Fleet. Well, in one case, um, uh, we had generally been doing our maintenance and the, these ships were World War II tankers, oilers, uh, ammunition ships, um, storage ships, and they were on their last legs. I mean, they really were. This was 19, uh, 19 um, mid 80s. And uh, so I, we had a very successful record of maintaining and you know, overhauling ships in Japan with a couple of private yards and uh, ship repair facility, Yokosuka, SRF uh, Subic Bay. And somebody in Washington, uh, I think the SEC Def or somebody, made a deal with the Korean government that we would send more ships uh, over to Korea and let their shipyards have a piece of the action to maintain. Uh, this aging fleet of uh, tankers and stuff. And so I, they said, they gave me the order to, uh, you know, award a contract over there in Korea. So I sent my maintenance people over there and they came back and they said, these people, they're, they're not capable of, of overhauling a ship. They're capable of building the most beautiful ships in the world, you know, tankers, uh, railroad ships, you name it. But they don't know anything about repairing a World War II uh, uh, oiler like the Hasiampa or something like that. So I, I sent that word back to DC and uh, long story short, uh, uh, the, the Secretary of the Navy at the time uh, called me back to Washington and said, read my lips, send a ship to Korea. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so in for a four month overhaul, uh, which ended up being a six month overhaul for the very reasons that uh, we had predicted. Well, then your predecessor, Admiral Jim Hogg, who was commander of Seventh Fleet, he's on my back. Where the hell are my tankers? You know, he was supposed to be here two months ago. Where are they? So anyway, I was caught, I was a lowly captain, caught in the middle, but uh, I survived anyway. <laughs> I'm glad any comments as a former Seventh Fleet commander. I'd have fired you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this this is typical. We have not had to worry about our MSC support since World War II. T think about it, Korea, uh, Vietnam, all the Desert, other recent- Desert Storm was huge. Yeah. That, well, we did, needed them, but they weren't threatened. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't have to worry about protecting them or having them operate with the forces. We haven't had to worry about that even today. And it's a bad lesson to have to learn in combat, especially against a near peer competitor, i.e. China or Russia. We need to fold them in closer we need to make sure at the operational level that we know what the hell's going on and whether or not this guy's getting the support he needs to keep the ships available for us to use. There are so many instances of failure because we've not paid attention to this important part of logistics, logistics, logistics. We've done it with airlift, done it with sea lift, uh, I can't comment on the ground stuff. I don't want to deal with that. I've got enough to worry about at sea. But that's something we need to do a better job at. And uh, Tom highlighted a great example of just what we're talking about there. Yeah, people occasionally fall in love with the term, let's operate at the speed of war. Yeah. But the speed of war is actually the speed of logistics. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's for you, Admiral Natter, and this is a question from an anonymous person in the audience here today. Well, wait a second. If he doesn't daughters, know... Huh? One of your daughters. <laughs> yeah, right. It better not be. <laughs> no, but it's about them. Uh, <laughs> you have three daughters in the service, two of whom are here today. Uh, what did you tell them to encourage them to serve? Well, I or think... Or Claudia. Claudia, yeah, what did you, you tell them to? Well, I think we, we didn't tell them anything. You can't tell kids anything. <laughs> we all know that. What we did, what we did is show them that serving and moving and being part of a military society, if you will, 
is a lot of fun and a lot of responsibility and a lot of hard work, but you deal with some of the best people in the world, certainly the best citizens of the United States of America. And I think that was all we did and encouraged them uh, to go and do whatever the heck they wanted. They chose the military as a, their next uh, step after college. I applaud them for it. I rec and let me tell you something. When I was retired, probably three years of certain rear admiral or vice admiral who was a great friend of mine who had worked for it, asked me, he said, what do you think about these women in the military? I said, well, let me preface my comments with, I got three daughters that are in. <laughs> <laughs> so think of what our military would be today without women. We would not be a military worth a damn because we wouldn't have the number of people. But also I would argue that they bring a whole different perspective on our responsibilities, not only with one another, but also <laughs> problem solving. I would argue in some respects that young women are a lot more mature than some young men. That's an overstatement, a generality that holds no water. But I can tell you that if you don't support having women serve with you, you're nuts. That's my opinion. All right. <laughs> Everybody's with you on that one. Uh, we're going to go to uh, audience Q&A. There's a couple of microphones set up in the aisles. Uh, if anybody has questions, please don't hold back. No, don't worry. <laughs> Use your outdoor voice. Hey, gentlemen. Yes. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Captain Carl Flynn. I'm in the Applied Physics program here. Uh, gentlemen, given both your experience in the Brownwater Navy in Vietnam, um, I was curious if perhaps looking to the lessons of history and looking at the potential threats we face today, most notably China with their maritime militia, as well as Iran and its naval forces full of small attack craft. Uh, do you think that the Navy service fleet that is today largely homogenized around guided missile destroyers and to a lesser extent the LCS, do you think that there is merit in bringing back large numbers of small service combatants to combat these threats in the future? Did, did you get all that? Uh, I got most of it, I think. Uh, what, what is the, how do you see the small surface combatants playing in today's challenging environment? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I'm not a big fan of the littoral combat ship. I thought that we could have done a better job in designing it. Having said that, we are nuts if we don't utilize it. We've got them. Now that we're talking with the Marine Corps and the Army about doing the island approach to things, which I think is a terrific approach to the challenge out in the Pacific, the littoral combat ship can play. Put some decent weapons on them, use that shallow draft to support the Marine Corps and the Army ashore and provide them certain missile coverage and that sort of thing. I think we can use those ships and we can make them work and they make them um, uh, a big part of our Navy. We need something to work in shallow waters. Mm -hmm. And the cruisers and destroyers and the carriers aren't going to work in shallow waters. Mm -hmm. the, if you look at the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, the, 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 those islands are made for those ships and made for that approach, that strategic and operational approach that's going on with our ground forces today. So I think it's a smart thing to do. We can make them work. Look, I was XO of a World War II LST in Vietnam before I went back with Naval Special Warfare. <laughs> Those things were put together with can openers. But I tell you what, they were very, very helpful and useful in Vietnam. So you take what you got and make it work, mm -hmm. and we're nuts if we don't do that, in my opinion. Tom? Yeah, the, the boats I was on over in Vietnam, they were uh, LCM-6s, Mike 6s, which was like 60 feet long with a bow ramp. I think those days are over. We're not going to be invading China, I don't think, uh, or going up the rivers of China. But I agree with Bob about the LCS. Uh, it, it's there. Uh, why are we decommissioning them all? Or we could be using them for uh, a meaningful role over in the Indo-Pac uh, area. In fact, when it was being built, and actually in the Pentagon, I remember this distinctly, going down to Norfolk for the first one that we commissioned and getting Naval Special Warfare folks on board, taking a look at it, going back to the CNO and say, this needs to be a primary mission for this ship, it's the support of Naval Special Warfare. That's a no-brainer. Because of the bureaucratic challenges of funding, they didn't do that. And I think it's a mistake, and it needs to be utilized for that purpose right now. I think Admiral Davids 
That's a nice job for you to take care of. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a perfect ship for that, especially in the island chain. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, next question. Over here. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Lieutenant Polander, Surface Warfare, uh, preparing to study East Asia, Indo-Pacific. Um, there's a prevailing historical narrative regarding Vietnam, this very dismal, uh, i.e., we shouldn't have been there, we were doomed to lose, so on and so forth. However, General uh, Hal Moore, in his good book, We Were Soldiers, challenges that narrative, in particular, the uh, manning and rotation policies that came to bear uh, later during the war that gutted the uh, combat season NCO Corps, uh, as opposed to the World War II model. Can you offer any uh, uh, military counterpoint to the prevailing narrative? I didn't understand the question. <laughs> yeah, um, I think there's that you're sort of being fuzzed by the sound system. Yeah. I think you're close enough where just we yell. actually hear it more clearly if you step away from the microphone and just use an outdoor voice. We, we, we didn't catch what the, what the question actually was. I can make up an answer, but I don't know the question. <laughs> can you please offer any counterpoint from a military perspective of the prevailing historical narrative that we were doomed to lose in Vietnam and we had no business being there? Because General Moore, in his book, We Were Soldiers, challenges that narrative with what he saw, particularly during the battle of the high in 1965. OK, so everybody didn't hear that. The question was, is there a counter position to the narrative that we were doomed to lose in Vietnam, given the level of effort and the level of talent that we invested there. Is that close enough? Yes, sir. Yep. Well, um, I was over there in 1968 and 69, and I was very enthused about saving the world for com from uh, communism and all. And uh, I went back, after I was wounded, I went back, uh, you know, I think 1971. I was on SYNCPAC fleet staff, and they sent me back to take a look at how uh, Vietnamization was going. That's turning the forces and equipment over to Vietnam. I went to uh, um, an army base down in the Delta called Dong Tam, which w was where we were based. And uh, I, I saw my old unit, my 25 boats that uh, we had turned over. We had spent two months, you know, refurbishing these boats, making sure they were top -not -not top notch condition. I went back in 1971. Not one of them was uh, operable. They were on a riverbank, uh, rusting away. The injectors on the uh, engines were gone, stolen, I think. Uh, the guns were stripped. And at, at, at that point, I knew, uh, hey, this ain't going to work. And uh, it, it turned me, you know, uh, uh, it opened my eyes, let's put it that way. I've got a pretty strong view on this, and it's probably counter to m what most people think. Because uh, we all went over there and did our duty in Vietnam. We were all committed to it. We tried our best to win the war. The reality is we should thank our stars we have a free press. Because I think the free press convinced our leadership and our people that this was a no-win situation. And I would argue that it was a no-win situation. I don't know anything about communism much other than they claim they're communists. But I would argue today they're as capitalistic as the United States is today. Now, is that communism? I don't know. And I don't care about communism. I'm, I'm a live and let live kind of person. I'm not sure that, uh, that the uh, benevolent dictatorship is not the right approach, as long as it remains benevolent. But we do a terrible job getting into wars and not knowing how to get the hell out and not what is our strategic objective. I'll give you a great example. Today, yesterday, we heard the Secretary of State talking about the priority is to free the hostages in Israel. That's not a strategic objective. The strategic objective ought to be able to say, our objective is to get these two divisive segments of society over there and have them get together and work this out. That's a strategic objective. Now, is it doable? Hell, I don't know. I don't know. But freeing hostages after what's happened there should not be a strategic objective. So I, I just have a problem with those kinds of approaches. 
we are better off today, and I would argue Vietnam is better off today for having us get out. Would we still like to be at war in Vietnam? I don't think so. I don't think it would have accomplished any more than they've accomplished by themselves. Afghanistan is another great example. People ask me, what about Taiwan? I was a senior observer for the annual war games in Taiwan for four years when, after I retired. And it depends on what happens. Are the Taiwanese going to be Afghanis or are they going to be Ukrainians? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. I don't think the Taiwanese know. So to me, we need, it's a political, we're getting into politics here pretty quick, <laughs> but we need to be more reticent about jumping into these wars and not knowing what the hell our objective is to get out. That's my opinion. That's, a, that's not politics, that's policy. It's yeah, a, it is. It's a good, it's a good difference. So it, Vietnam is one that we should have gotten out. Uh, I regret mightily the people and friends who were killed there, Americans, doing what we thought was right. But I would argue that was probably not a good achievable objective. My opinion. Thank you. Over here. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Lieutenant Vanderpool, Service Warfare same, Officer, same study. Thing. Just step away from the mic again. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told I'm pretty hot voice. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Lieutenant Vanderpool, Service Warfare Officer, studying operations research here. Sir, I'll, I'll start with uh, common knowledge, all schools know command C is absolute. However, there is a growing perception that commanding officers are often backed into unwinnable, unachievable situations, assessment schedules, maintenance, availabilities that they're ultimately doomed to fail if they can't be on time and then are subsequently dismissed for lack of confidence. In your opinion, gentlemen, do you believe that the tolerance for failure has decreased to just an unwinnable level for commanding officers? Or do you think this is required in order for us to meet our growing list of commitments around the world? So for those who didn't hear, the basic question is, has the Navy gotten too risk averse? Are we putting our leaders in a position where they, where they are unable to take the necessary risk to accomplish certain aspects of the mission. Is that fair enough? Sir, I think, I think more importantly, in non-operational sense, a lot of times commanding officers are dismissed due to lack of confidence when they're given schedules and inherent situations that they have no chance of winning and can't say no to. And so over time, there's been, I believe, a perception that SEALs are just being dismissed, that the ship fails, and they'll just get the next SEAL to take care of it. Do you yeah. believe that there's a lower tolerance for failure or do you think that this is a necessary mechanism to ensure we're meeting our commitments? Got it. So besides risk aversion, it's is there a lower tolerance for, for failure? Are we putting commanders in an untenable position? Yes. Well, you know, my daughters always say, Dad, you've been out of it too long to know what the hell's going on. And it's true. And I don't know exactly what's going on and what you're just talking about. I've heard about it. But I would argue also that even when we were commanding officers and the division officers, there was always more on our plate than we could ever achieve. Commanding officer's job is to prioritize what's most important for the effectiveness, the morale, the good operations, and the good order and discipline of this ship and this crew. You're not going to do everything. We've never been able to fit all the demands into uh, execution. Anybody who tries is nuts. So a commanding officer's got to be, have the uh, maturity and the experience enough to say, you know, this is one that we're not going to spend a lot of time on. Yeah, I understand that. We're required to do it. Things like planned maintenance is important. You've got to do your maintenance. You've got to do, you, a commanding officer is responsible for knowing what's going on in that ship. That's from the top of the mast down to the very bottom of the keel. And I'm dead serious about that. If the commanding officer doesn't go up the mast at least a couple times in his tour, he or she's not doing their job. So unless you're willing to go do that, and let your people know that you're gonna make the right decisions with respect to priorities and be able to say this is more important than that, I don't think you're ever gonna be successful. Now everybody, if you're wearing the uniform, you like to complain, everybody does. Even the commanding officers do. But. Uh, that's my opinion. This can be successful. You've got some people out there who can do the job, uh, and I would say it's your job as a commanding officer to do it. Yep. I would just add, uh, you know, if you're in a leadership position on a ship with XO, CO, department head, whatever, uh, make sure you're giving your men and women 
under you uh, the proper tools to, uh, number one, maintain their equipment, number two, advance themselves. Uh, I always thought mentoring uh, young sailors, uh, was probably young sailors and uh, officer sailors too, mentoring them was one of the most important jobs as, as I had uh, as commanding officer. One more question over here. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Lieutenant Rios, Flight for Officer Gage. Uh, I have the privilege of making a port call in Vietnam for the USS ship, and I'd love to hear your opinion of current U.S. Vietnam relations. Well, the question is about the current relationship between the United States and Vietnam. When I was 7th Fleet Commander, I tried to get a port visit uh, for any ship, especially the Blue Ridge, up to Hanoi. And I had two objectives in mind. Number one, the ambassador at the time was uh, Captain Peterson, I think he was. He was a POW there for like mm -hmm. seven or eight years from mm -hmm. Pensacola, I think. And uh, he called me and wanted to know if I would be interested in having a ship. And I said, heck yes, I think it'd be great. Uh, but I also wanted to do, after the visit, if you take a look at the charts, to be able to go on the north side of Hainan Island is a freedom of navigation, because I just like doing stuff like that. <laughs> but it fell through. He tried to get it done, and I think the U.S. Navy got cold feet, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and didn't have it happen. We got into it later, and the Vietnamese insisted that we fly the Vietnam flag uh, at the top of the mast, I think. And so we refused to do that, because that's not our tradition as a Navy. So I, eventually it's going to happen. In fact, as a matter of interest, Claudia and I are going over. We've been asked to be guest speakers on a ship, a cruise ship there from uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh City. That we, we know it as Saigon, down the rivers and up the coast, hitting a couple of ports in Hanoi. And we're going to go do that. Be my first time back. Mm -hmm. Kelly, do you have a thought on that? No. <laughs> uh, another question here? Yep. Oh, PG school. <laughs> you want to go with that, Tom? Well, I, I'm amazed that they invited me back because my my track record was uh, in in the pits. But uh, <laughs> uh, it was a good experience for me. Uh, I, I I must confess I didn't work very hard while I was here. <laughs> I, I I had just come back from Vietnam and I've just finished limited duty, um, back on it, uh, full active duty. But uh, meeting uh, uh, fellow students from all the services, from some of the foreign countries and all, this was back in 1973 or so, uh, it was an eye-opening experience just to exchange views, um, see, see how they felt. And, and it was the first time in my Navy career uh, that I was exposed to others um, whose views might be different from mine, but it was a, a real enriching experience. Mm. Well, I, I enjoyed it very much, too. And I would uh, argue that Tom was a better student than I was. <laughs> but having said that, this was a perfect place for me. I came back, was in the hospital for a number of months. Uh, my good friend and SEAL ONC, who I worked with over in the Vietnam platoon, Commander Dick Couch, and I came here with orders. And we, you know, at the time, I said, we're lucky to be here, lucky to be alive. Let's buy a house on 17 Mile Drive. So the two of us went and did that. We were single. We got jobs down in Cannery Row, a place called Flores Tending Bar at night and on weekends. Uh, we came to class. We didn't study too hard. <laughs> but we had a ball. We had a great time. It was perfect for us where we were in our lives. Uh, this place was great. Um, I had a, a professor elder who was, I think, the provost here, right, Rich? And his advice to me in the class was the best investment you can make in business is the investment in your health. And he was right. Stay healthy, stay active, keep your mind and your body working hard, and you can't go wrong. And this place was a great education for me in that regard. 
and I'll leave with that as my lesson number one learned. If the uh, induction into the Naval Postgraduate School Hall of Fame was based solely on <laughs> academic performance here in Monterey, <laughs> the, the, the list of inductees would be very different. Uh, and, and thanks, Rich, for asking that question, and also thank you for your leadership of the Naval Postgraduate School Foundation. Uh, sort of current news, uh, Henry Kissinger just died. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a major figure uh, with respect to U.S. policy in Vietnam, but the question isn't about that. The question is about when you were deployed sort of back in the day, so this is a sort of a time machine question, what, what was it like with respect to understanding news, understanding what was happening, before there was social media, before you were deluged with countless sort of sources of information instantaneously, even making a phone call back home. And Tom and I were talking about this this morning at breakfast. Even in my first deployment a few years after theirs, <laughs> um, to make a phone call home from a deployed location in the Western Pacific, we had to we had to go through a series of ham radio operators. And you would say, I love you. And a ham operator would say to some, another ham operator, I love you. And then a ham operator <laughs> would say to another ham operator, I love you. And it's always, I love you, over. I love you, over. I love you, over. I love you. And then 10 minutes later, it would come, come back, I love you, too. <laughs> Unless he was joking. <laughs> <laughs> And, and letters exchanging in the, in the mail about, mm -hmm. you know, I'm pregnant, are you sure? And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and so, so it's just kind of a then and now story because, mm -hmm. you know, current reports, if you haven't had the opportunity to talk, talk to your family in 24 hours, it must be a crisis, that, that sort of thing. And so, um, and any opinion you have about the, about the pluses and minuses of of being deluged with information and having instantaneous communications now compared to that? Yeah, I, I think it, I have two answers to that. Number one is uh, I think it was a blessing in, in my case that uh, I didn't know what was going on back in, back home, uh, whether the washing machine broke or, uh, you know, one of the kids got in a fight in school or whatever. And, and so not knowing that, I was more able to focus on my, my job at sea. Uh, the other aspect of that is, uh, the reverse aspect is, uh, daughter Jane, who's in the audience right here, uh, Jane was born while uh, I was deployed uh, many, many years ago. I won't tell you how many, but, uh, uh, and I, I obviously knew my wife was pregnant when I left, but um, I, was sitting, I, I was sitting in the wardroom, sitting in the wardroom, we had just received mail from the carrier, and, uh, and one of the guys said, hey, congratulations. I said, for what? He said, well, you have a baby daughter. And uh, I said, holy cow, the, uh, Red Cross didn't notify me. I, I got it from one of my fellow uh, wardroom guys. Uh, his wife had written a letter to him saying that, uh, you know, Jane was born. <laughs> so there were two sides to that coin, really. Uh, communications in those days was not nearly as fast and furious as it is today. The news business is a lot of opinion. Some of it is just crazy opinion, and I don't think it's helpful, regardless of whether it's true or not true. Uh, it's, you know, this instantaneous news is a race between networks to be able to get there first. And a lot of people don't worry about the facts. A lot of networks don't worry about the facts. I mean, we, we all know of instances like that. So the blessing in not getting news was that you at least, but when you got it, it was fairly accurate. The other side of the coin is that uh, you know, as it affected us in Vietnam, occasionally you would have a ceasefire. And the ceasefire was not something welcomed by us in the field because we knew that there, the VC and the opposition were going to be moving and taking advantage of that ceasefire. We had rules of engagement where we could go out and set up an ambush or, or look the other, and if there's movement, then we could take them under fire. But we didn't feel good about that, and we didn't want to do that. 
but the ceasefires really didn't help us in the field at all. Uh, I thought it was necessary politically for a whole different set of reasons, but for people in the field, it did not help. And, and it, we felt it was counterproductive to what we were trying to get done. But communications, you know, for family, it's much better today. We, the only communications we ever had on ships, when, you know, till after Vietnam was mailbags. Some of them made it, some of them didn't. <laughs> Um, sort of one last question about, about continued service. And both of you have remarkable, admirable careers in, in uniform, but you continue to serve after, uh, after your respective retirements. Uh, Tom, you served largely the veteran community in many ways, and uh, including as the Secretary of the Department of Veteran Services in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You helped veterans, a, a whole gener you know, generations of veterans, but you were there when the first uh, veterans of Afghanistan and Iraq started transitioning back into, uh, back into you know, out of the military, back into um, civilian life and, and dealt with the early challenges of that. Bob, you've been, much more involved in supporting the active duty service members, veterans as well, uh, but you're supporting education. You, you're a member of all the boards for the Naval Academy and Naval Postgraduate School and Naval War College, and, you've, and you, you, besides your support of veterans, you've made a name for yourself in supporting higher education, education across the, uh, across the active duty force, and you've done that for, for years and years and years. So can you just talk about Sort of why? What? Why is it important for each of you to continue to serve after already having served uh, so much and so well? Well, um, I was lucky, and Bob was lucky when we came back from Vietnam. We both stayed within the arms of uh, Mother Navy for the next 20, 30 years, or whatever. So we were not exposed to uh, some of the hatred and vitriol that uh, our fellow veterans faced coming home from Vietnam, getting spit at, being called uh, baby killers, this, that, and the other thing. So it, when it came time for me to have an influence on how we treated the veterans uh, uh, coming home to my state, um, that was in the back of my mind. And I had a lot of help from four different governors up there in Massachusetts. Uh, the, the challenges coming for the Afghan and uh, Iraqi veterans coming home were quite different from uh, the earlier veterans we were serving from Vietnam, Korea, World War II. Uh, things like traumatic brain injury, uh, suicides, uh, drug, drug use, um, uh, difficulty in getting a job, employment. So we really changed our focus and, and concentrated on uh, health care, education, employment, and housing. Those are the four big issues and we made a concerted effort to, uh, w with the help of other state agencies and with the federal government, uh, to uh, deliver those products to uh, our returning veterans. Thank you. Bob? Uh, I think it's just in, you know, uh, just respect and love for the people that I've worked with through the years. I mean, we've all met wonderful, wonderful people who started out with nothing came into the military, we've served with them, they've turned out to be wonderful men and women, citizens and service people, doing something above just selfish reasons. I know when I was a kid, my, when one of nine kids, my mother said, every one of you boys are going into the service, period. That's be expected, now go figure out how to do that. And so going into the service and being part of it just really drove it home for me. You know, we only have a short lifespan to live, and you know, what the hell else am I gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many ways to serve, and you two have served, sure served as, uh, as role models uh, for that. We have time for one more question from the audience, if there is one, and well, if there isn't one, or even if there is, uh, I'll ask you two, is there anything you wish we'd talked about today that we didn't, any question that, we, that you wish we'd asked, uh, that we didn't get to. 
about your service? Well, I just encourage everybody in the room, uh, I think most, most of you are officers in various branches of the service, but uh, uh, remember the men and women serving in your unit. Uh, take care of them, uh, put their welfare above yours, uh, mentor them, encourage them to uh, reach their full potential, and I think you'll be a really good leader if you do that. Thank you. No, I would second that. I mean, the men and women who come into the military today all have the potential to be generals and admirals as far as I'm concerned. I guess I'm exhibit A to that. You know, if I could do it coming in as an E1 going to boot camp, anybody can. And so our job as officers especially is to make sure they've got the opportunity uh, and boy, oh boy, you better respect the hell out of what they do because some of the best people I've ever met in the military have not been officers. They've been enlisted men and women, and I'd go to hell and back to support them, and I ask you to do the same. You can stay seated. You're not going to start following orders now. <laughs> over to you. Thank you. Prior to my giving uh, our token of uh, appreciation, the last thing I wanted to talk about, yeah, is the notion of being a hero. We have two medal, of, we have a Medal of Honor re recipient and two Silver Stars uh, re re um, awardees. But it was Tom Kelly who pushed back on the notion of being a hero, and you heard him today. And one of his comments in a speech that he gave is, ordinary people, like we are, do not have to be wearing a uniform to do heroic things. A grade school boy or girl can do the same thing when, I, when faced with a tough decision. Stepping in when they see something wrong, that is heroism, that really is. And so these are men and leaders who have taught us how to, how to be leaders, not only in the military, but in their civilian lives and in their families. For this reason, they are national assets, and I dare to say, national heroes. Thank you, sirs, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> aye, aye, sir. Ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Beautiful. Yes. The Cypress. Yes. We saw this today. You did. Admiral? Thank you. Sir? I think I slept under that tree in the class <laughs> once. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much.